The general idea for the tutorial that Randolph asked for was something fairly inclusive, perhaps something historical, try to set some context and so forth. Seeing as how the story of cybernetics is itself fragment, fragmentary and subject to a lot of different interpretations, uh, so is this tutorial. Um, what I decided to do was to take one particular rambling slice out of thousands that one could take through the subject matter and to try to uh, talk a bit about why cybernetics, what is cybernetics, where did it come from, with particular regard to how does this lead to a conference on listening? That last part being predicated on um, what does cybernetics have to do with interpersonal communication? I'll explain the title later because I picked Rosenbluth for a couple of reasons and because it was alliterative with Richmond. Okay, the big question that everybody asks all the time and that no one can answer. As you may have seen on the ASC website, we have an entire page of different people's definitions for the general subject matter of cybernetics. And the Heinz quote here at the bottom is perhaps the most pertinent one, that no matter who you ask, they're going to have an opinion. And pretty much all you're going to get back will tell you more about the person giving you the opinion than about any definition for the field itself. We sort of like it that way because, well, no one can come up with a crisp definition, and secondly, we like the aura of mystery, don't we? Now, okay, so if nobody can come up with a nice, positive definition for what cybernetics may be, will it become any clearer if we step through the history or talk about different aspects of it with regard to people or topics or anything? The short answer is no. That's not going to work either. These diagrams, which I will not describe in detail, are simply uh, selections that are representative of dozens that can be found in various books, online, and so forth. If you go about it in terms of lineages or literally a timeline, it's going to get tangled. It will get tangled because there is little agreement on who's involved, what happened, or how things interrelate. The associations and differentiations are all over the place and will vary with a particular author or person giving you an idea. Okay, so if I can't make sense of it in terms of historical <coughs> threads, can I perhaps make sense of it in terms of phases or stages? Pretty much the same thing applies there. No, you can't. And for the same reasons, because depending on who it is that's telling you, who or what it is they may be tracing, they will subdivide the entire storyline in entirely different ways. Another approach is to try to say, okay, let's take cybernetics and can you just, for example, put it in a Venn diagram. Can you simply tell me this is cybernetics and this is not? Can you say that within this set of things there are subsets, one of which is cybernetics? Same thing. Depending on who does the categorization, you're going to get lots of different effects. And you will either find everything in the world subsumed under cybernetics or cybernetics subsumed under one or another of all the other fields that are related in some sense. Well, finally, the one that might seem to make the most sense is, okay, so it comes down to the work of particular people at particular times for particular purposes, et cetera, et cetera. What if I map the people? Can I do that? And you will run, once again, into the same problem. It's difficult to draw associations the associations you draw will shift depending on the context. Are you going by topic? Are you going by historical influence or personal influence or collegial status and so forth? And another problem is that some of the primary figures cited in the history of cybernetics have some very strange personal histories. Some of them come from different backgrounds, work in different sectors or contexts, and similarity or divergence in any factor relating to these different people may or may not 
represent similarity or divergence in their ideas, positions, theoretical stance, whatever. So having basically told you that this is an exercise in futility, which has never stopped me before, let's proceed. Let's do the old textbook thing. One of the major themes that led to coalescence of what we now call cybernetics has to do with behavior and control and communication in some sense. Most of your standard histories will, will mention that. The particular cut I want to take through it today, the particular thread, has to do with automaticity and self-regulation. Now, automatic mechanisms go back centuries. Some fairly complex automatic mechanisms go back centuries, uh, such as, as illustrated here, the Chinese compass card, which I believe goes back about 2,000 years. The ancients had certain devices that could operate on their own or react on their own or adjust on their own. But the particular ones we're interested in are those that are self-regulating in some sense, where the operation of the device has an effect upon its own state or the trajectory of its behavior. For those, we can still go back to the third century BC. And does anybody know the correct pronunciation of that name? Is it Sisybius? Oh well. Mathematician and the original cybernetic hacker, Alexandria, uh, whose water clocks are still considered the first examples of self-regulating devices, at least those that are known. The idea of self-regulation continued even among the ancients till by the last century BC in Roman times uh, self-filling wine bowls were fairly common naturally among the elite and then the establishment of such, such self-regulation in devices wasn't very common during the Middle Ages. It really came back again with agrarian mechanization, particularly windmills. Mills, windmills, similar large apparatus. Then that led to the steam engine and on and on and on. The classic example of a sub-device, a partial device or a component that is meant to regulate the rest of a large machine is Watt's Flyball Governor from the 1780s. Actually, this particular type of centrifugal flyball governor was used on windmills in northern Europe uh, a century earlier. And I'm not really clear how far, how much farther back perhaps the flyball type governor had been used. The important thing here, uh, as far as we're concerned, is that it's not that machines had self-regulating behavior. It is that up through these centuries, up until fairly recently, the last century, there was very little attention given to this behavior as anything other than a novel characteristic of a particular device. In other words, nobody looked at it and said, that's interesting, I want to study that as a particular concept, construct, or idea. So until the 20th century, uh, 19th century, we'll say, Self-regulation was largely limited to the hackers and inventors, and it was a very specific characteristic of an individual thing, usually a device or machine. In the 19th century, self-regulation started to be addressed primarily in medicine and biology, not so much in physical sciences or among the hackers, so to speak. Originally, the early part of the 19th century had a number of biologists who had something to say about the way that organisms somehow steered their own behavior. It was fairly rare, though, to talk about it as a subject in and of itself, or to talk about what we would now call the entirety of a feedback loop. 